Hello, I'm Tsuikat and welcome back to the second channel video. Today I want to talk about monarchies, actually. I know this is a weird topic, but it's something I wanted to go over because living in the UK, I, you know, it's just kind of ingrained into me that there is a queen and she has some amount of role in the country. But for a lot of people, it's surprising when they realize that there is actually around 30 kings or queens left in the world. Uh, because, you know, you might just assume that, like, especially if you live in the US, like, oh yeah, we kind of got rid of the idea of kings and queens a long time ago. Everyone is pretty consistently agreeing, with a few exceptions, that we have democratic elections where the people of the country vote on who rules them. That is a pretty consistent thing across the board, right? Well, it's actually not. Like I said, there's about 30 kings or queens left, and if you look at this map right here, you can see they're pretty geographically spread. So, in today's video, I want to explain how exactly that is possible, because it's pretty nutty to discover, but it almost makes some sense when you learn the history, the context, and it's something I figured I'd go over, because there's so many just weird and fun tangents that I had a lot of fun researching it, and I figured I wanted to share it on YouTube. So, hopefully you'll enjoy it. Let's get straight into talking about monarchies, shall we? So, monarchies seem to be a pretty consistent fact across, you know, human history, at least across human history in most of the world, because when, uh, you know, like before at least the 19th century, the way a country was formed is there'd be lots of rivaling little villages, tribes, or even, you know, miniature kingdoms or princes. Basically, there'd be some form of power structure that would be much smaller than modern day countries, and someone would go around and they'd, unif you know, they'd like unify all of these by like conquering them, and they'd make them into their own little country or kingdom. Yeah, kingdom is a Again, something, a king, dumbish, it's all in the name there. But basically, uh, they unify all of these to make a country, you know, which then turned eventually into modern day countries, which were kind of like kingdoms, and they're like, I rule this, by the way, because I killed all of you and I made you submit to me, and also, because I'm in charge now, I'll eventually die, then my son will be in charge, then his son, and so on and so forth. This is a really consistent thing across the world. Uh, exactly why that is, is, you know, hard to, you know, pin down exactly. But you can easily just see how, like, a country that doesn't do that, every single time their monarch dies, you know, eventually there's a big uh, crisis about who should be in charge, do they want to fight again, or do they want to just have someone be in charge? Civil wars, as you're all probably aware, are pretty disastrous for a country, and that's why I guess monarchies might have an advantage, because they have a clear line of succession in a way, in a way, place that doesn't necessarily make sense otherwise. So, yeah, this is a pretty consistent formula, it's for most kingdoms, and most countries really, that exist today. They had a bunch of disparate separate places that were eventually all conquered together in some way, usually by a king, who usually made it that thing his case. So, to kind of show you just how, like, you know, really, uh, it's only a recent thing that we got rid of them, in 1815 almost, so just 200 years ago, or 202 years ago, here is a map of Europe uh, with red uh, sign, oh sorry, here is a map of uh, Europe with red signifying, uh, you know, countries that are uh, you know, monarchies, and with blue signifying countries that are, uh, you know, republics. So, as you can see, in 1815, there is just uh, Switzerland in blue, and the rest of Europe, with just a few, like, tiny German states, otherwise, is just entirely monarchies. It's just how things were in Europe, it's how things were in a lot of the world, and then if you scroll through over time, here's a hundred years later, oh, now France is there, and now so is Portugal, and then another 15 years later, it's like 50-50, and then here we are today, where a decent majority of Europe is now a republic without a monarchy at all. However, there is still 13 monarchies in Europe, and that's something that you might find be surprising, because surely all of these, you know, like, once the wave of, like, you know, democracy swept over, surely it must have infected every country. Like, how is the UK not democratic? Like, I saw it on that list, like, I saw the UK has a monarchy, so does Sweden. I thought Sweden were the good guys, for instance. That's what you might think. And the answer to that question is, even the countries that weren't affected by this sweep, where they got rid of the uh, monarch, because bear in mind, in Russia, for instance, they had the big communist revolution, pretty famous for it, they just killed the monarchies, because they didn't want any way for them to come back, so they're killed, they're dead, it's gone, now we are communist utopia, and that's how it happened in a lot of countries, they exiled the monarchs, or they killed them, or they just sent them away and said, you're not a monarch anyway, usually it was one of the first two, but sometimes it was just the last one, but still, they got rid of the monarch and it was gone forever, however, a few countries basically just adjusted to being like, okay, what if we go full democracy, but we keep our title and we keep our nice land, so this is how the vast majority of democracies, around, uh, 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 monarchies around the world actually work, and, um, so let me just show you four things right now, because I want to actually clarify, there is one big, uh, there's a few big exceptions to this. The big exceptions are, uh, you know, total monarchies. So these are monarchies where the monarch of the day, you know, the person in charge, is descended from someone who eventually conquered the country, and who still has complete control, is still the head of government. The most famous example is Saudi Arabia. That's right, the Saudi Arabian king, he's called Salmon uh, something, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the Saudi Arabian king is still in control of the country, he still has full power, and they just have a king. And to me, that's wacky. 
tricky. Uh, that's why they have so many weird decisions there. They're doing like modernization things like, you know, what? women should be able to drive. What a crazy modern uh, revolution. But that's something that is generally happening, uh, you know, in Saudi Arabia. But like, it still happens to this day. Oman is still a, you know, a monarchy where the monarch has like absolute power. Um, Swaziland in Africa, same thing. You can argue to some extent North Korea is because even though they're not a king, they have the same like, it's called like eternal revolution where their bloodline has to keep on continuing this on. Basically, there are still monarchies around the world. My favorite example is technically um, the Vatican City where there is a monarchy and they do have absolute power of their country. One of the smallest in the world, by the way. Um, but technically it's elected, so you can be like, well, that's fine, right? But yeah, basically there are still some absolute monarchies around the world where that happens. But for the most part, that's not the case. For the most part, the monarch of the day uh, in the UK, for instance, kind of just uh, you know, use their power less and less, relinquish more power to the prime minister, and eventually the prime minister got more and more powerful. And then eventually it reached the point where the king, even though uh, the king slash queen of England, for instance, or the king slash queen of the UK, let's just say, uh, still has technically the power to veto any law going into effect, that she can still be like, no, actually, I won't sign that. Because for any bill to be signed off, she has to, again, sign off on it. And that's like a key part of the procedure. There's two, uh, you know, houses of uh, parliament, and then there's the queen it has to go through. But in practice, she's never, you know, signed, uh, like, refused a bill. And that's, for, most, for the most part, most countries around the world monarchies, they have monarchs that are just really hands-off. Like, they still officially exist, but they don't really do anything. So then it raised the question of why do we keep them? Because it costs some decent amount to keep the monarch, and given that it looks kind of, like, antiquated and backwards, why do countries still have monarchs? And this is something you can look at from country to country, have a different example of. I think it's um it's a fun little thing here. So here is um the constitutional referendum 2003 because it's, it's just, before we go any further. I thought it was really funny that Liechtenstein had the opposite thing where like recently instead of having this slow thing where like oh yeah the prince of Liechtenstein can actually you know over time he's like you know losing power like in most countries. No, in Liechtenstein they had a referendum like a real one and 64% of their population voted to extend the power of the prince to be able to dismiss the government, veto legislation, and nominate judges. That's right, they gave their monarch power, and that's pretty crazy by itself, but it's also pretty crazy when you think about Bhutan. So, Bhutan is actually the most recent country to go from total monarchy, where the country was entirely ruled by this this guy, you know, the monarch, the king of Bhutan. Uh, you know, he totally ruled it, he was entirely in charge, and uh, they, they tr and transitioned to, you know, democracy, democracy only in 2008. And the reason this is so interesting is because in 2008, when they did that, it was actually a really unpopular decision. People were like, no, we don't want elections, we want you, the king. And, you know, whether that was overstated for the media or not, you can argue. But, you know, it seemed like it was a real thing at the time to me. Uh, Bhutan's a very interesting country. But the thing I thought was uh, kind of fascinating <clears throat> is here you can see, here's the article. He uh, he was ruling for 33, power, uh, 33 years. He gave it absolute power in 1998. And then in 2008, he said the first elections would be held. And just as a fun fact, because... <clears throat> Sorry, by the way. Um, but well, just as a fun fact, because I found this interesting, um, so they use gross uh, national happiness as a little thing, and again, it's something that always comes up. If you ever study economics, this country is the most fascinating one, because it doesn't value the GDP, the value of products produced, it values the happiness of its people, and they only unblocked TV recently because of that. But also, um, I was reading an article about like when the thing was, so I can confirm it was 2008, as you can see right there. 2008, the BBC reports it right here. But just as a fun little, like, the, the last little thing here is, like, the king is a nice, simple man. He has a simple lifestyle. He, he works in a small log cabin above the capital, while his fortress-like palace is used by his four wives, all of whom are sisters. And it's like, this guy sounded so cool, like, gross national happiness. He abdicated willingly so he could make a, a democracy. He did all these cool things. And then, oh, by the way, he has four wives, and they're all his sisters. Like, what the... <laughs> Like, I mean, you know, that's that's monarchies for you. They're pretty nuts. But yeah, so that's the most recent one to go like that. But looking at, when you look at all the uh, monarchies that are in Europe, you might question, why do we still keep them around? Like, it's such a, um, that I think like there's a Republican everyone. <clears throat> And by the way, but uh, in case you're curious, like, wait, why are you talking about Europe so much when this map clearly shows that, like, Canada has a monarch, Australia has a monarch, Papua New Guinea has a monarch, um, you know, countries over here have monarchs. Well, you know, technically, there is a monarch in places like Japan. They have the longest running, by the way, fun fact. We're, we're just going through fun facts about monarchs today, it seems. But uh, fun fact, Japan has the longest running chain of monarchs, where you can see the family tree going all the way back to like 600 BC. And it's disputed, but it, you know, some people claim it goes all the way back to 6,000 BC. 8,000 years of continuous monarchs of Japan. Fun fact you might have known. Uh, the UK has a pretty long one too. Uh, there's a website called Brit Royals, where you can see the family tree and trace it all the way back to 849. Uh, so 
Fun fact, here's the family tree of the UK monarch. And uh, also, I, I know we're just going on a side note on a side note here, but what we already taught in school in the UK that Henry VIII had like six wives and that was significant, but I never really believed it because I heard some European monarchs had nine. But here you can see everyone on this list has like one wife and there's Henry VIII with like, you know what, one wife, two wife, three wife, four wife, five wife, six wife. So fun fact there. Anyway, going back onto the main point. So yeah, why, why, do, why do European countries keep the monarchies? And also what's the deal with, uh, you know, Australia, Papua New Guinea, etc. And also they're in a different color, you might notice. So one of the fun facts about the world is that the queen, who is the uh, queen of the United Kingdom, is technically the queen of all these other countries. And all of these countries are in something called a personal union. So a personal union used to be a big deal back in the day because it meant the countries were essentially controlled by the same person. And to the, you know to this day, this is still a thing that exists. And it means that the UK, uh, you know, the Canada, Jamaica, Papua New Guinea, Australia, are all technically controlled by the same person. The same person has veto power in all their legislations, it's on all their monies, etc, etc. Uh, New Zealand too, by the way. Always forget about New Zealand, but still, it's on all of their money. And uh, the fun fact about this, though, is that the queen is technically not the same queen across all of these places. So one of my favorite example, uh, one of my favorite, like, just Wikipedia maps ever, is the list of current reigning monarchs by length of reign. And uh, Queen Elizabeth II, who is the longest reigning queen of England, uh, of well, I guess the UK, I should say, is actually also the longest reigning queen. Uh, she Basically, on this list, it has the 54 monarchs that currently exist. Queen Elizabeth is not the first longest reigning monarch, the second longest reigning monarch, the third longest reigning monarch, the eighth longest reigning monarch, the tenth one, the... <laughs> the 13th through 17th, the 19th through 21st. Basically, she's the longest reigning monarch and she's also beating herself like a bunch of different times. And that's because she technically became the monarch of these uh, countries at different times. And she's technically the same person, but also she's the different person at the same time. It's confusing, it's really complex, and I, <laughs> it's hard to get into. But basically, because different countries went independent at different times, because different countries accepted her as a monarch, and because the crown is this really complex corporation, the Queen of Canada is the same person as the Queen of the UK, but it's not the same person as the Queen of the United Kingdom. Hopefully that explains things really easy. Uh, <laughs> hopefully that makes things uh, all wonderful. But just as a fun fact right there. So yeah, why don't we get rid of our queen? Why does Canada still keep a queen from a different country? Um, why, why is this the case to this day? And to some extent, that's because, oh yeah, that's how things always work. Canada wants to remain on friendly terms with the UK. They keep their monarch. There's no point in getting rid of it. Australia wants to stay on friendly terms. They have a referendum to get rid of her. And, you know, people vote no for it. So that's kind of cool, right? But yeah, basically, all uh, you know, these... Um, these countries kind of retain it because it's just like, well, it's a historical thing and it's fine. That's the same reason Jamaica does, same reason Papua New Guinea does, even though it wasn't a British colony, it became an Australian colony and same chain of command that happens there. So basically, you might question why do, you know, countries like Sweden and Belgium, so here is the King of Sweden, he's an old man, still does his stuff, King of Belgium, wears a suit. Why do these countries uh, still keep their, you know, kingship to this day? Why do they still have them around when they essentially don't, uh, you know, like, provide anything for the country. They just exist because they exist. Why don't we just overthrow them and become a true republic? And I think this is actually a fairly popular thing amongst most of the people, right? Like, why we don't want the king anymore. We don't, I, don't, I don't want the queen particularly in the UK, but the truth is, is there's just, uh, you know, there's too many benefits at some, uh, you know, point to remove them, uh, because to remove them, you have to go through some big thing of, like, well, they're gone now, you have to sign the laws and do it. In some countries, that might be worthwhile, but in the UK particularly, it's a well-proven fact that even though we pay the Queen some ridiculous amount of money, I think it's uh, 45 million a year, somewhere in that ballpark, a lot of money. She brings, she pays the government like 200 million because she owns lands that the government gets the rent. It's confusing, but just she, you know, basically she gives the government 200 million. And also having a Queen brings in a lot of tourism. The United Kingdom, which I don't know if we'd keep the name if we weren't a kingdom. Uh, you know, a lot of people go there because they're like, the queen, she lives in Buckingham. They say Buckingham, they don't say Buckingham. They don't say Buckingham, sorry. Uh, Buckingham Palace. And if you stand outside it, like all of these people do, like you can see how most photos are, are, then you can stand outside and you can maybe glimpse the queen's real bodyguard. Some people love that. Like the crown jewels, the real crown that a monarch holds to this day is something that's crazy. And this is less of a big deal for Belgium, but the queen also acts as like a figurehead. Uh, like she goes around the world and she does diplomatic visits. And because, uh, you know, like these countries with kings get a lot of soft power from their king doing like informal stuff for the country. Basically, it's like having a diplomat, but the diplomat is like world famous. Even, you know, like before this video, you probably didn't know about King Philippe of Belgium, sorry, but you probably did know about Queen Elizabeth. You probably did know about King Gustav. You might have known about King Salman. He's pretty famous, 
for I mean, he's a bad example because he actually rules the country. But still, these these monarchs actually do something for the country. And I'm not saying I'm in favor of monarchies. At some point, I bet 500 years down the line, 300 years down the line, maybe even 100 years down the line, we won't have a monarchy. But right now, it's just like, well, it's kind of beneficial to keep it. And they're not doing anything. So how about we just limit their official power? And uh, yeah, for the most part, it's just like, I guess we'll leave this how it is. And also, there's the the, the final, this this is an argument in favor of democracy, uh, sorry, in favor of uh, monarchies. I don't quite like it, but it is technically true. There's kind of like a fail safe. If somehow uh, in the UK, we vote for like some tyrannical party that vowed they're gonna nuke ourselves, they pass a law, that suspends our civil rights, or, you know, they, they they become, if we vote the Nazis, literally the Nazis, like, a party called, like, the British Nazi Party, they get in charge because we make a mistake, you know, that's, it's happened to a, to a country or two around the world, or just, just a country, I should say, around the world, um, so, you know, like, it could, it could have been anyone that happens to, but still, if that happens, the Queen can technically stop them passing laws, and it's like a fail-safe, that's never been used, and you know, Liechtenstein voted for it, so uh, clearly, clearly there's some value in it, and, uh, yeah, it's stupid, but it, it works, and it, it's, you know, it's not as stupid as it seems, unless you live in Saudi Arabia, Oman, oh, sorry, Saudi Arabia, Oman, uh, North Korea, Swaziland, or potentially the Vatican City. So there you go, fun facts about monarchies. Before I go, because I had one more that I don't know how to include, but like, let's include it here. So Bulgaria actually exiled their king when they went from being a kingdom to being a, uh, you know, socialist republic, because, you know, Russians, USSR, serious influence. Uh, they actually exiled their king, but their the, the king at the time, who was the last Tsar in the world, C-Z-A-R, last Tsar in the world was Bulgarian Tsar. He came back to the country 45 years later, after they reverted back to capitalism. I mentioned this in the Bulgaria video, but he, he, he went back there, and then in 2001, he won an election. So he's one of the only two uh, monarchs in the world. I think Cambodia had the same story I learned afterwards, but basically he was the king of the country and then he came back, and the people voted for him to be their Prime Minister, and tell me- oh wait, was it Prime Minister? It was the Prime Minister. Um, and tell me that's not the coolest fact about monarchs around the world. See, monarchs are so popular in some countries, they'll vote for their monarchs, and they'll vote to give their monarchs power, and that's weird. Also, also weird, you know, before we go here, because if these videos aren't just about cool things that I want to tell you, uh, then what are they about? Uh, in the Liechtenstein referendum, there was six- uh, there was 14,000 votes, right? Like. <laughs> And, like, I, I don't know, it's just funny to me that, like, they can do a countrywide referendum and it gets 14,000 votes. And 212 people did invalid votes, like, you know what, you probably, if you live there, you should be like, oh, Carl, you gotta do this correct, why are you doing it invalid? It just seems a bit weird. Anyway, with that said, thank you very much for watching. I think that's everything about monarchies I wanted to say today. Uh, it's a pretty wacky idea, honestly, like, the, the fact that, like, to this day, we still just, like, accept it and all these countries have some form of monarchy, it's weird. It's strange, but it just about makes sense, and maybe that's this channel too. So thank you very much for watching. Second channel, don't care. Wait, wait, wait. Check out my sponsor, which is myself, and my Amazon link. It's down below. And if you buy Amazon Prime, or you get a trial even of Amazon Prime, I get free dollars. It went down recently, $2.99 maybe. Uh, so for Christmas, get yourself some Amazon Prime, and second channel, don't care. Goodbye. <laughs>